Drama and true stories. Well, that, that tripped me up a little because I was thinking, oh, this is all about telling true stories. And then I, I thought, Chocolat is based on a true story. And I thought, it's autobiographical. It, it is, yeah. And, uh, you know, hey, it, it could be. You know, and, and I thought, and um, it just had me thinking, uh, rethinking my whole knowledge of true stories or what they could be or other possibilities. And um, nevertheless, I think maybe. As we talk tonight, it's clear that our real theme is possibly drama versus true stories, not in an adversarial way, but just that sense of what makes a story a story. You know, because after all, I think we do deal with, I mean, you have Erin Brockovich, who I, I just saw a news item about her, you know, recently. She's still out there, I keep, and I, I keep thinking of the movie instead instead of the person. It's, it's almost like you, you so effectively created that portrait of her. And so there is a, a, a true story, you know, and, and the drama of it is so authentic that, you, that it sort of handed itself to you. But how do you tell that story, you know? How do you, how do you tell... How do you tell Chocolat in such a way that it maintains its its kind of fairy tale character? Because it has a sense of magic to it that's actually very real and grows out of the characters. But at the same time, you have to believe it. You have to have to anchor it. And you know, We Own the Night uh, is a movie that I love. And and you know, I I believe that that's a true story, right? Or is it? And that's the I, I have to ask this question. Is this on? Uh, I based it on. Mostly true. I mean, I made up very little from it, but I have a lot of people that say, oh, "I don't believe that. It would never happen." And I made up like virtually nothing from it. So that's called failure, I think. <laughs> well, I thought you know a good way to start would be to ask a, a question that is a, a thematic question that uh, I, I'll invite you each to answer, which is, you know, in terms of germinating a story, what is, what is it? The, can you recall, paint a picture for us in words of the moment that either a fictional impulse hit you and, uh, or a true story appealed to you and what it was about it that really landed you or really caught you and how do you go about landing it? What, is it? what do you require of a story to feel that that story is told and alive? Well, um, I think I can answer it since you Please do. brought up Chocolat and, and I made the quip that it's autobiographical, but in some sense there's some kernel of truth to that. Um, that in the case of that story, I mean, it was based on a book and the, the book was sent to me in galleys. Um, and, you know, it was it's something that's very removed from my own experience, but I recognized in it the dynamics of a small town and kind of the oppressiveness of a small town and I grew up in a little town in Pennsylvania and I kind of recognized the character types that were expressed in that novel um, you know even though you know on the face of it, it it's totally removed from my own experience so I, I sort of found the thing about it that made it personal and I think there there is some kind of indefinable thing when you're drawn to a story there's something about it where you go oh I, I, I know that story I can tell that story mm -hmm. um, you know and then I, I I've, I've said this before but um, uh, when I was trying to get the job, and I was on a phone call with a bunch of guys from Miramax, and and I had gone through a long list of things that needed to change. I'd kind of re-outlined that I said that you know the novel's good, but it, there are a lot of things that needed to change to make it cinematic. And I went through my whole spiel, and they said that all makes sense, but we wonder if you're European enough to tell this story. <laughs> Uh, and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not. I hope you weren't misled. I'm, I'm American. <laughs> and they said, uh, well, how much time did you spend in that part of France? And, um, and I took a long beat. <laughs> and I said, my wife and I fell in love in France. <laughs> was, that, was that true? Well, it was a bit of a stretch. Uh, it was, I, I took some license. We, we, we did go to France and had a great time, but we were already married. So, uh, but, but let me put it this way. We were still in love when we came home. Um, you know, but, but I, I had the confidence to take license in that area because I felt like I could own the story in some other way. Yeah. Um, you know, and I remember, I think this is a quote from Anthony Minghella who said that, you know, when he read The English Patient, you know, he loved it, he absorbed it, and then he put it in a drawer and locked the drawer because he had to make it his own. Mm. You know, that there was something that spoke to him in the novel and he sort of took the pieces that were there and then said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to absorb them and, and, and generate them back out in a, in a new form. How does that apply to you, Susanna, that, uh, that notion? Well, I think, you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, stories, r real stories out there, people's stories, that are interesting. Mm -hmm. But if I don't have a reason I want to tell it, then I shouldn't touch it. You know, the, the best example of this, I think it was around 1990-ish, two movies came out. One was called Pre, 
about Steve Prefontaine. And then shortly thereafter, Without Limits came out, which was written and directed by Robert Town. And if you want to just know the difference between just telling a series of events and taking a series of, of events and um, dramatizing them in a way to say something larger that you have in your head, look at those two movies. They're virtually the same events. And Robert Town had something important he wanted to say that he could hang on this story. And it's and, and the difference is just phenomenal. It's, it's the greatest, anybody who's thinking about this, watch those two movies side by side because if you if you don't have some reason you're telling this story and not somebody else um, you know Chocolat in somebody else's hands would have been a completely different movie Aaron Brockovich in someone else's hands would have been completely different and that's what breathes the life into it that uh, that you know elevates it above just a series of, of events because by and large people's lives day by day are, are pretty dull, you know, so. And I, I, I wanted to ask, I, I'm going to start with you, Susanna, on this because here you, in Aaron Brockovich, you actually had a, a live person who you could speak to, and I'm wondering how closely you worked with her, uh, and then how did you shut the door on her if you had to, to create the story? And then, you know, I, I would like to expand that to the to the panel just in terms of, you know, getting close to your story and then, and, and renouncing it in a way to, to try and tell it. Uh, that was... Um that was trickier than I thought it was going to be because I I immediately was drawn to her, um, and I think it's similar to the way you approach things. I don't ever ask why I'm interested in something. I know it's coming from some far less conscious part of my brain, and and that's probably where the best work comes from. And if I ignore it, it will do its work. If I really try and focus and analyze it, it will shrivel up and get paralyzed in fear or something. So I, if I'm drawn to something, I just go after it. I don't think about why. And, you know, eventually you have to say, okay, what am I saying? And, and, and you know, articulate it a little. But so I was very interested in her. She, I found her to be a very compelling person who had um, found herself, put herself in a situation that I was drawn to. So I spent a ton of time with her and really just, you know, rode in her car and she spends all her time in her car um, going over these vast distances and hanging, you know, tagging along with her as she visited people. And so it's just a ton of time, and I spent a lot. And then she had actually collected a ton of materials, you know, all the legal stuff. And yeah, it was interesting. I was not allowed to talk because of the settlement. I wasn't allowed to talk to any of the plaintiffs. That was they had, you know, a non-disclosure agreement. We'll give you the money, but you can't tell anyone what happened. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but before they had signed that, Aaron had videotaped every one of them telling their story. So I had all their videotapes to go through as well. So uh, it, was, it was fantastic. Um, you have to fictionalize those. Uh, change the names. Change the names. But not the not, not the, story. the story, not the uh, actual. You know, I definitely um, used composites and things like mm -hmm. that. But, um, but so I spent enough time with her to feel like I knew her. I had her voice. That comes very sort of naturally to me is to to feel the rhythms of how someone articulates him or herself. Um, and then, and then I sat down to write, and I had been spending quite a lot of time with her, and I really have tremendous fondness for her. And uh, trying to put words in the mouth of someone for whom you have tremendous fondness and respect is incredibly paralyzing. And, and you know, you think, what would she say? Well, what do I know? There's somebody I can pick up the phone and call, and she'll know much better what she would say than I would. So, I, you know, you sort of lose that... Mm sense of being all powerful in your work which you kind of need um, and and after a couple days of just feeling like I had you know little Tyrannosaurus Rex arms there's just no mobility at all in what I was doing uh, I decided okay to hell with it there are two errands there's one it's a woman I I really am so fond of and then there's this fictional Aaron I'm creating and I can do whatever the hell I want with her and I will just hope and have faith that my um, clear-eyed view of her will make the fictional Aaron um, honor the real Aaron. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I get to the end of 
what was at that point 170 page first draft. If I get to the end of that and it doesn't look like her, I'll, I'll start over, you know, because, but this is the only way I can feel like I have the room to do it. And, and that character ended up so much closer to her than anything I tried to write without giving myself the freedom to completely uh, betray her if that's what happened, you know. And, it, and I didn't, and she didn't feel betrayed at all. Robert, I noticed that in, in the forthcoming films that you have, there's a title Crowley, and I wondered, is that Alistair Crowley by any chance? Or no, no. Okay. no. I, it actually happens to be a true story, um, the first one that I've worked on. Oh, um, okay. And I found it to be a really daunting experience for a lot of the reasons that Susanna was just talking about. Um, um, it's, it's a guy named John Crowley who, uh, as a young man, found out that two of his three children had a really serious genetic disease, which was going to kill them unless someone found a drug. And he, he quit his job and raised millions of dollars in venture capital capital and went into, went into business with a very difficult uh, cantankerous doctor uh, and it's kind of about the two of them and how they have to learn to, to work together but the guy's children's lives are at stake uh, you know and he finds the drug and, and doesn't cure them but but keeps them alive and now they're looking for the next generation of that drug in the meantime that same drug when given to children who are diagnosed very early is, is quite effective um, you know but I I had a similar kind of experience where I'm trying to write John uh, you know as a, and I'm realizing still alive and you oh yeah he's a young man yeah, yeah. And, I, and I spent a lot of time with him and with his family with his children mm. um, you know, and felt very kind of personally responsible. I mean, I'm, I'm used to making up stories. I'm used to just making shit up, you know. <laughs> and and the idea that I, that I had some sense of responsibility that I'd never felt before was initially paralyzing. And I and I, I went through much the same process where I said, okay, I have to. There is this fictional character, um, and and the doctor in particular now has become uh, a, a composite character um, because there were things that the doctor did in real life which just don't make a good story. Um, and so you know, I talked with the producers and talked with lots of people and said, well, there are other people who took other actions. Can we kind of combine them into this character and call it a composite character and give them a different name, and w which will round out the story and create a complete relationship between these two guys? Um, and so that's what we did. Um, you know, and probably the most nervous I've ever been in my life as a writer uh, is when they gave the script to John Mylene and their kids to read over the weekend, and I was just pacing the floor. Um, you know, and finally, you know, like Sunday evening, John calls me up, hey, how you doing? Nice script, you know, like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and he said, oh, you were worried? And I said, I said, like, you know, I just, the, the sense of responsibility. Uh, and he said, oh, this guy's much wittier than I am. I, you know, this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is so he's good. always proven misquotation uh, is uh, the you know, grants. But, but you, but you do have to, you know, in the same way that you have to when you adapt a novel, you have to be ruthless in some way. You have to, uh, you have to do to someone else's work what you always do to your own work, which is you have to you have to kill your favorite parts because they don't fit, or or because there's a better way of doing it. Well, this paints a question which I'd like to I'd like you to deal with first, Bob, and then I'm throwing it to you, James, which is about it, it comes off of James's phrase of heightened reality. You know, you and 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 what Susanna is describing in terms of hitting, so to speak, the real Aaron Brockovich by 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 turning away from the actual Aaron Brockovich. So it's the, I think it has to do with intention. In other words, dialogue, the heightened reality it strikes me is that it's the intention of the, what's the character's motivation and intention and, and that shapes how they say what they say, doesn't it or, or does it? Sure. I mean, well, you know, what you're doing, I mean, a lot of what you're doing when you write a screenplay, you know, it's like to pick up on what James was saying about, you know, marriage, how you fall in love. I mean, a, a script sort of goes through stages similar to a marriage. It starts out that you fall in love and there's, it comes from that deep place and you don't know why and you can't explain how. And then you create a relationship with this, with this object, this, this script, and then you start to struggle and you have to work it out the way you have to work out a marriage. There are differences. There are things that you didn't foresee. That idealized love that you felt at first now has become something gritty and real and you have to you have to shape it I mean you have to you have to figure out what works and what doesn't work and kind of and and I think you know in my case at least you know uh, early on I decided if I have to choose between uh, you know honoring the the facts uh, and making a good story I'm gonna make a good story and let the chips fall where they may I mean, obviously there are things you can't change because they run completely contrary to historical fact but there are plenty of character things that you can change and and you do if, if they make the story better right 
Now, James, the you know one thing that's striking about um, you know we own the night is the the authenticity of it feels very real in terms of Russian mafia and the period because it's the late '80s, and also I realized after enjoying the film that you you're the guy that did Little Odessa, so it seems to be a, a milieu with which you were already familiar. Could you talk about that familiarity and 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 dealing? Well, with that, I you know I always just saw that as a shortcut to. Uh, you know, everything I, I've tried to do, and doesn't mean I've succeeded in this, but in a way, what I'm always after is a certain authenticity of emotion, if I may say, that uh, quite the opposite of perhaps what might be in vogue in certain quarters, or the ironic distance from the characters. And so in trying to get at a certain authenticity, well, I've tried to steal from my own life, you know, when I grew up in New York and uh, knew those guys. Doesn't mean I liked them, but I knew them. Uh, and... I just sort of, tr I'm trying to connect with the characters in every way that I can. And I know that's a very superficial approach in a way, but in a sense every approach is superficial in the beginning, you know, and then you have to kind of mine the depths. And when I say this authenticity of emotion, it cuts to what you're talking about, about how what you're trying to get at is what the character wants, what is inside. I mean, the best example of adapting something really, I think, f that is from actual to real, as you might call it, uh, for me would be Raging Bull, which in the details of the story is an, a terribly inaccurate movie. I mean, and, and if you ever hear people, ah, th that's so realistic, that movie. <laughs> because, you know, Marty put all these great details in it, which feel make the picture feel so lived in, and what Lamada's central struggle is, is from the book, which is this profoundly self-destructive, tortured individual who finds his only place home is the ring. And it's the perfect metaphor for self-destruction. Somebody lets himself get beaten and so forth. So, you know, they, they found that element of the story, uh, and then he changed everything else. But it, it kind of didn't matter. I mean, this whole thing about, you know, his brother, and maybe there's a relationship with Vicky, that's all invented. Which, you know, Scorsese stole that from Visconti's movie Rocco and his brothers, which is one of his favorites, and he basically grafted that onto the story of Jake LaMotta, which had nothing to do with anything. So he, mm -hmm. he got at the emotional truth, which is this self-destructive, tortured individual, uh, uh, really only through his own personal details. And one other thing about Raging Bull, which I'm, I, I love the film, obviously, and I, I, I think it's really an interesting fact, is obviously Lamada never, Lamada apparently never, well, he went to prison, but never banged his head against a prison wall going, oh, this is so stupid, this is so stupid. But what happened was when uh, De Niro was talking to him, interviewing him for the character, you know, 25 years after he wrote the book or whatever, uh, he stood up in the middle of this meeting and bashed his head against the closet door and went, I was so stupid, Bob, so stupid, so stupid. And De Niro, of course, went, well, i got to put that in the movie. And there it is. <laughs> so he, in other words, it, there, oh, it's, it's right. not the, the facts of the case aren't there. It yeah. doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Yeah. I don't know. I, for me, I didn't, I, I'd never, I met the guy, the real guy, basically on the 9 on once. I, I, I'm writing this thing about an explorer now who's a real guy, and fortunately I can't meet him because he's been dead for 80 years or whatever. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> so uh, I don't have any of the worries that these far Much better that way. <laughs> now, Susanna, how much uh, license w did you take? I mean, in the larger sense, you know, uh, Robert was talking about making composite characters. Were there any characters that you had to composite or uh, deal with or uh, was there any stretching that you had to do to make the story fit no it was the it was the opposite of stretching it was it was just selective deletion um, mm -hmm. you know I mean everybody's life is messy and Brockovich's life is really really messy I mean you know she and her boyfriend broke up you know six times over the course of the time period that the movie uh, covers well, that, that's a nightmare. Nobody wants to watch that. So you just reduce it to one that tells the truth behind every single one of those breakups. And Aaron watches it and says, yeah, that's exactly what happened. She doesn't think, wait a minute, he left and came back four or five other times, you know. Um, and then, yeah, some minor characters were composites. Um, but not that many in that one. You know, the soloist uh, did a lot more Did a of lot that. more, I was going to yeah. ask, yeah. Yeah, it was funny. I was you're talking about that uh, Jake Lamont thing. I was thinking about the soloist because when I wrote that, I I uh, 
have a lot of uh, affection and respect for Steve Lopez, who's the, one of the main characters in that. And, uh, and I wrote it pretty true to who he is. And then uh, Joe Wright came in and, you know, he had, he got, he got 30% Joe Wright. He sort of became 30% Joe and 70% Steve. And then Robert Downey came in and, and what you see on the screen is probably 50 Robert, 30 Joe and 20 Steve, <laughs> when, you know, when all is said and done. But, you know, the spirit of what that journey was, what that, that, time of Steve's life was like for him is completely there and and Robert wouldn't be able to do it if he had just been imitating Steve he obviously had to internalize it as well and who knows maybe I maybe somebody would look at my version of him and say that's you know a good percentage you rather than 100% Steve so uh, you know interpretation definitely modifies any dramatization of anything and also, you know, I think when you're in the process of writing, pretty early on you stop asking the question, what did he do? And you start asking the question, what would he do? Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got the character in a room in a certain situation, and you say, what would this character, as I have come to understand him, and as I'm coming to understand him, what would he do? And, and you come up with more interesting answers. I wonder if, the, if it doesn't also mm -hmm. a matter of what would I do, because... Right. Uh, you know, David Mamet has pointed out that, you know, one thing I that's true of an audience is an audience always identifies with the protagonist, no matter what. It, it's an instinctual thing. And, I, and from a creator's standpoint, it must seem that maybe this, the business of falling in love with a project has to do with, it really is feeling yourself in, a, in, an in another life, perhaps. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that issue, you know. Well, I, I I have a problem. My problem. I have many problems, but I, I have uh, my <laughs> the, the biggest problem I have really when I first get to a story is actually uh, making it less c compli complicated and complex. And I know that seems counterintuitive. Like, what do you mean you want a simpler character? But movies, really, even the best movies, are kind of pop psychology in a way, because. When I've heard people say, well, I put myself into it, and I try to do that as much as I can, but it's only part of myself because, I mean, if you, you, you don't really, Michael Corleone is a very com complex character, but his psychology is kind of simple in the movie, right? Yeah. What I want, what's most important is no more attempts on my fault. You know what I mean? It's unbelievably yeah. concrete what he wants in the picture. And it's weird. Howard Rodman, by the way, has, has come in. Won't you welcome Howard? <laughs> There was a mental traffic jam. Yeah, I'm really sorry, I'm apologetic. Robert, Susanna, James, Howard. Hello, hello, hello. So. Oh, <laughs> Me too. So, I, I just, just want to see my father. Cramp. I was just saying they're all pop psychology, so you have to reduce it. And I find myself working on motive. I mean, you can't film motive. So I find myself trying to choose, in a sense, a specific series of motives because most people a they don't know their motives and b there are about 62 different motives and movies can't get into that weirdly enough sort of long form television sometimes has a better i mean the sopranos was able to examine uh gandolfini's character in a in a very complex way because it's you know it's almost like an epic but you know what i mean it's like you have so much but in a in a movie even if it's three hours lawrence arabia four hours uh, you know and and still the whole point of it is he's an enigma you know what i mean there's always a simple idea yeah, yeah. anyway so that's the challenge for me weirdly enough is to tr try and eliminate a lot of the noise and get to what is specific yeah i find that what, what sometimes happens and a lot of writers talk about this when they first get excited about a project and they said it's this but it's also that you know it's got a hint of this but it's also that and it's like, and pretty soon you get rid of also that and also that and you and you find out what this is you know and that becomes the movie yeah and does it do you find that it changes a lot in other words do you yourself have an evolving relationship where you you've begun a project and you think Oh, this is why I'm into this, and then suddenly you discover it's something else. Another character takes over. I mean, this is less true, perhaps, in the case of an Aaron Brockovich, but in, in in her shoes, for example, you've which has a very realistic bite to it. You know, you very two very believable sisters. I mean, they must have been sort of warring for your attention. Yeah, I, f I feel like it's a little bit like what you were saying. You know, for the first, I don't know how long months, mm -hmm. two of of working on something. You know, things will take. Once you know what you're doing, then uh, you know it, it. That happens less, and it's a matter of finding the, um, 
you know, uh, complexities and dimensions of that of that clear idea as opposed to the complicated ideas bouncing around, you know? By way of welcoming Howard, I'd like to just uh, ask you, throw a question to you. I, it, it would be in relation to, it's, it's, it's a question, it's some ground we've covered, but I'd love to hear your take on it because, you know, in two cases, you know, um, Joe Gould's Secret and, and Savage Grace, you're dealing with true stories. But you are having to, you have to tell them lucidly in a, in a compressed space. And I'm wondering, you know, well, first of all, how, what what was it that sang to you about Joe Gould's story? Can you identify that? And what what was the challenge of landing that one in terms of telling it well? Um, in terms of Joe Gould, um, what appealed to me was um, this was based on a nonfiction story that was in the New Yorker. It was actually two pieces, one that was written in 1946 and one that was written in 1964. The first one was a New Yorker profile by Joseph Mitchell about a famous Greenwich Village bohemian uh, named Joe Gould III who um, spoke seagull and could do Chippewa Indian dances and was writing the most important book of our times. And the piece in 1964 was a much longer, more intimate, more meditative piece on the relationship between the journalist and his subject in the 20 odd years after the article was published. And uh, what uh, attracted me to it were all of these things. One, um, it was about people who can't write. And if there's anything that appeals to a writer, <laughs> or that a writer knows intimately it's not writing. Um, and so there would be days I would be, you know, staring at the wall knowing that I was in keeping with the theme of my project. <laughs> Um, but the and also as somebody who was a, who is a lapsed or recovering journalist, I often have had very very queasy postscripts to people I've written about, where kind of um, I thought I'd kind of glorified them, but they thought otherwise. <laughs> Or even worse, when you thought you'd done this really snarky, subtle hatchet job on somebody and they didn't get it at all. Um, <laughs> so so um, the idea of you know, what happens after somebody does a profile or a portrait of somebody else was of, of deep interest to me. And the idea of not writing, uh, the idea of... Um, um, as Sam Beckett says, you know, every word is a stain upon silence. You know, that spoke to me. So that was what I was trying to do, um, was to get those things through. And maybe, as you said, that's one too many things, because that's already two things, and there's probably another couple more. Um, and do it in a way that was fair to Joe Gould, who was deceased, who was a character, though, who I much admired and had heard about during my, you know, lost bohemian days and had walked the same streets as and knew people who knew. And what really, really terrified me was writing the character of Joseph Mitchell when Joseph Mitchell was alive and was a writer I respected above almost any other journalist. And I had to sort of, you know, write the screenplay and talk to him and write his character and walk around with him. I mean, it was, it was, was the, the terror of that was what drew me to the project, I think. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, and it's very in line with what people are saying. How did you, were you at all paralyzed by uh, this fear? It sounds like you still am. <laughs> no, uh, you know, what, what do you think I was avoiding by not being yeah, here? Yeah. No, um, <laughs> no um, yeah, it was really hard. I actually, uh, didn't I had many opportunities to meet Joseph Mitchell um, as I was writing, and I said no because I realized I wouldn't have the strength of character to sell him down the river as a screenplay character while I was in conversation with him. And I actually didn't um, meet him until after the first draft was finished, and I had slightly fewer butterflies in my stomach about that. Um, to talk about something that James had mentioned, um, the story is called Joe Gould's Secret. The book is called Joe Gould's Secret. It took me almost a year of writing to realize that M Joe Gould was not my central character. Um, mm. It really was eight or nine drafts in before I realized that I had the wrong protagonist. So um, I'm, all I can say is, you know, if any of you feel like it's taken you a while to find that, <laughs> I'm right behind you. Do you remember what it was that, that gave you that realization? You yeah, um, I do. Um, I was 
trying to, uh, this is going to sound really corny. Um, the question, whose story is it, is the first question you should probably ask, and I'd never asked it. Uh, I just assumed it, and I think the title of the piece had overwhelmed me. And then I was asking the dumb question of, well, who changes? And it's not always your protagonist who is the person who changes. I mean, look at any Steve McQueen movie, you know. He's not the guy who learns, he's the guy who knows. But for most of the kind of stuff that I think we write, we're trying to look for who, who ends up in a different place than they began, who takes some kind of journey, who learns something about the world or about, hopefully about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I realized that Joe Gould met none of those criteria. And he really was the catalyst for a much more intimate and, and kind of subtle journey of self-discovery that his biographer went through. But boy, did it take me a long time to, to, to see that. And once I'd seen it, I just couldn't realize why I hadn't seen it from day one. Did the writing go particularly swiftly after that? or oh. <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> it didn't, you know, I mean, there were many, many drafts because there were many, many producers and many studios. But uh. the writing went... There was l l many more days where I finished writing where it had given me gifts and many fewer days where I just beat my head against the wall. Well, uh, the body that's buried under my question is actually one that I think every writer can deal with, and you're uh, welcome to jump in, anybody. But the, oftentimes when you're creating a project, it seems that the, the 10 months that you spend digging the tunnel in the wrong direction sometimes is actually your real research. I, I find, anyway, I mean, it seemed to me that sometimes it's like, why didn't I see this 10 months ago? Well, I needed to tunnel the, dig the, dig, I needed to go the long way to find the shortcut. Because all of a sudden, it's like all this gets fed in and it gets fed in and, and all the false stuff drops away. But there's like nuggets of gold that I, I found because I was actually beating my head against the wrong wall. And I'm just wondering, does that, is that a... I think you know. believing that is the only thing that keeps you from killing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes. Absolutely true. Every day yeah. is a good, worthwhile day. And the writing does go swifter, I find, when you when you <laughs> hit that. <laughs> oh, and any day when you actually write instead of pace around and pick lint off the carpet is a good day. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that though there's there's more, I mean, beyond the sort of humor in it, which of course all of it is true, sadly enough, there's a great truth to what you're saying because I, I'm not really a believer in the idea of genius, uh, certainly not my own, but I'm not, a, but no, but I'm not because I think that the idea is very destructive, you know, that we have romanticized, you know, like, I just sat down and I started writing and it was genius. That doesn't ever, ever, <laughs> ever happen to anything that's worth anything. And what happens is, even when the f final product is marvelous, particularly in films, you know, cinema is such a collaborative medium, which doesn't mean it's not the product of one mind ultimately really, but it's such a collaborative medium that what I find, be best advice, I'm going to drop a name, but it's really worthwhile because it's the best advice I ever got. It sort of freed me from the psychosis, I think. <laughs> was uh, Francis Coppola said to me once, he said, you can't ever fixate on writing something great. What happens is you keep working and keep working and keep working. Or you, say, you, know, you keep working and eventually it's something. And I'm thinking, well, you, 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 it's you, it's something. I don't, I don't know. But, but no, but what he, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there. He said, the f you know, first draft, Godfather Two. I didn't know what I was doing, you know, and I started putting all these things in it, and, and I have his original outline for Godfather Two, and it's like, it doesn't really resemble the movie. It's all over the place, kind of a mess. There's like, fifteen char like characters, like Al Freeman. It's like bizarre, mm. and but what you can see is a kernel, you know, and there's something here that he used, and he kept working and working. working and eventually obviously came up with a uh, masterpiece. So I think that it's important for, uh, for writers, um, I call myself loosely that, is never to contemplate, I'm going to do it, it's going to be great. Hmm. That's very destructive, I think, in the creative process. The process always reminds me of uh, really, really slow cooking of scrambled eggs. 
<laughs> because honestly, you just throw it in there and it's gook and it's disgusting. <laughs> and it swims around formlessly and you stand there, but you have to stretch it out over months. And you stand there and you stir it and you stir it and you stir it. And eventually it sort of congeals and, 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 and holds together and looks like something, but it takes a long time and a lot of the work is done. I always say I kind of write uh, you know, by blind, by braille, kind of like just close your eyes and feel around for something that feels good, you know, and you, and you grab onto it and hold it and make something of it, and and uh, maybe it turns into something, and maybe it doesn't. And I, I figure there must be a much m more efficient way, but th this is the only one I know. One other uh, brief tidbit. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm monopolizing everybody uh, this time, but uh, I I. J was playing for my children uh, a disc of the Beatles anthology, which was volume two the other day, and I heard a version of the song I'm Looking Through You, which was great. And it was like take 29 or something. And now the version that wound up on the record is the greatest thing ever, but it was also take like 70. And you're thinking, this is the Beatles. That was when they recorded. It was 1965. They were at the peak of their popularity, and they did like seven bajillion takes. Like the idea of rigor being an incredibly important part of every, any artistic endeavor. The, and and it, what is most destructive is reading people, interviews with people. They say, I just did it. It came right out in 10 days. I did it, and that was it. It's so so wrong. It's not what, that's not, I mean, once in a while you're very, very lucky. I don't know, maybe it happens to you. But most of the time it is the scrambled eggs thing. I like that. I'm going to steal it. And, and, and it's working and working. And even if, if the Beatles had to do it, then uh, what chance do the rest of us have? Robert. Well, yeah, and the real, the real test is that when you start out, it doesn't work when you start out. I mean, you have to, the bad, I, you know, to go back FX to your earlier question, you know, the bad ideas do lead to good ideas, that you start out usually with the not so good version. Right. And sometimes you really hit the wall, which is another place that tests you and tests your commitment as a writer. I mean, y you know, what I do, um, it, this doesn't happen very often, but when I really hit the wall and, it, and it's not working and the story just sucks and I don't know what I'm doing, I mean, most of the time, 90% of the time as a writer, you're trying to psych yourself up and give yourself confidence and say, you know, keep going, it's going to be okay. There's really something good here, keep going. And then every once in a while, if you really hit the wall, you know, what I do is give myself permission to say, Jesus, this sucks. And I sit down, uh -huh. I go in a different room, the room that I don't usually write in, and I take a yellow pad and I write down everything that I hate about it. It is a therapeutic <laughs> catharsis. And it sucks for this reason, this reason, this reason. All the things that I hate about it and why I would never want to see this movie or inflict it on anyone. <laughs> and about 70%, 30% of the time, I end up concluding that it is a piece of shit. But 70% but of the time, that process will lead me to, I wish it were more like, and I wish the character, were, and I wish this could be more like uh, this kind of movie. And you lead, yourself, you lead yourself out of the dark hole. Oh. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody Thanks. steal that one. It's great. That's I, I, I know that, you know, my whole writing life is a sort of shuttle between two ways of looking at it. One of them is, you know, I, you know, great mountain great writing is built by climbing mountains of crumpled paper, you know, and, and the way you get it right is by doing all of the wrong drafts and making the wrong choices. And then you sort of know what you're doing and um I'm really glad to hear you talk about sort of writing blind, because I do, and I assumed that I was the only person who did, because <laughs> I <laughs> didn't know how to outline. Um, but the other, the other, the other pole of that for me is is uh, on my college newspaper. There was a sign, there was a clock. It had a kind of blood red second hand that never stopped moving, and there was a sign above it that said, uh, "This is a daily, not a weekly." And after 11 <laughs> p.m. At, at night, the managing editor would put up with great ostentation the, the second sign, which said, don't get it right, get it written. Uh -huh. mm. yeah. And so I believe in both of those things entirely, which is that you, know, you can't really write until you've done all of that work, which includes writing badly, which includes not writing at all, which includes feeling suicidal. <laughs> but also, at the same time, at a certain point, that blood red second hand keeps on a moving and the sign goes up that says don't get it right get it written and and you know you know when when the lord gets ready you got to move so so I believe how, both of those things. How do you make that happen in your lives? I mean we're talking I guess obviously a, a panel full of successful writers you can basically make your own time to do it but it must seem that even with the many claims that are on your attention to various projects and the many people that are getting hold of you you have to struggle I would think a little bit to find the quiet 
space in the day, or it's, do you need a quiet space? Do you can you function in noise? How do you access your unconscious on a practical level and get it get it written? I try to connect it to sleep as much as possible. I get up at some. I get up at like four thirty in the morning, so I can have a couple hours of writing that's connected to dream time, sleep time, Great. before my kids are up. Because if I start the day making lunches and worrying who has her flute or his soccer. I mean, there's no chance of tapping into that. And then, if, honestly, if I start the day like that, I just I just call the day a wash and try and get a whole lot of other shit done. And um, if I don't start that way, or the other thing I do is I'll get my get sleepy at night. And then when I'm if I'm sleepy enough to write, but not so sleepy that I'll fall asleep at the computer, I'll try and do it all then. But I think dream time is, you know, the closer you can be to dream time, the best, better your work is going to be. Mm. Yeah, I used to get up at 4.30, but I don't have that much discipline anymore. <laughs> but uh, it, is, it is the best time. Um, you know, and, and, and when I do wake up in the middle of the night and write, that's, that's the most satisfying time to write. Well, I, I had a ritual which is now over, and it was great. Um... I procrastinated most of the day, and then at midnight, I made a large bowl of popcorn, and I worked until about 4.30 in the morning. And then I decided that I would have like 93 children, and so that's over. <laughs> and now I have this crappy little office uh, where I go after I feed the kids breakfast, pretty much nine to five, and I think I get the same amount of work done as when I worked for a three or four hour period in the middle of the night. But you know, married with children, I really don't have the option of doing that anymore. And uh, it's very unfortunate, and I, I, I never thought any other human like woke up at four, th I, I thought I was just from Mars or something. But it, you're quite right, it's like no one else is awake. You feel, you get the 4 a.m. scaries, you know, you wake up and nobody else is awake. Nobody was awake, no, no phone would ring, there was uh, the only thing on TV was like you know the Richard Bay show or whatever like nothing you would ever so I just I could sit and be uh, you know unmolested and it was really great and 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 that's been over for the last year. Um, at the risk of sounding like a walking cliche, I too get up at 4:30 in the morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> my my espresso machine is on a timer. It goes on at 3:30, so that by the time I wake up, it is warm and primed, and all I have to do is. Flush eight ounces through the porta filter, um, fill it up, put it in, count to 35, and I've got a really, really good um, ristretto. And then uh, <laughs> I write that, you know, and th by that time it's noon. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no, I mean, I write from around a quarter to five in the morning till, um, till I either have to, you know, make breakfast for my kid or, you know, all of those kind of family things. Yeah. Um, these days I've been getting up because I'm on a deadline a little bit earlier and breaking it into two shifts punctuated by a bowl of oatmeal. Um, <clears throat> I, I find that there's a certain amount of writing you can get done in a day, but if you can break your day into two days, either with a nap or with oatmeal, you can get two days done in one day. Um, but the idea that no no one else is awake, that you don't have, you know, and, and you, you, you're right, you are... The little notes that you get in your sleep are th are still there. Those little wisps have not yet sort of gone into the air. You can kind of catch those tendrils. So I, 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 I have to ask you that, that does that stuff is that stuff good? Because I get the those espresso. And, no, the little ideas that you have. Because I always write down ideas in the middle of the night that I have, and and the ideas are worthless the next morning. I, I one out of ten. Come on, one out of really? ten is good. I just right? every when I read, I'm like, what the hell? What does that mean? What is well, that? It's, <laughs> what is this stoned idea? Right? Yeah, it's, like, it's crap. Well, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, because you're you're in that cuneiform state of mind that you were you were in 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 sleep, I think, and it's just, it made sense to the dreamer, you know. But the, the I I knew a guy once that he was a buddy of Norman Mailer's and he told this story about Mailer. Mailer made a, a great cult of his unconscious. He felt that he had to he had to preserve the in unconscious intact from sleep to to the writing, you know. It just because it, it was like a still pond. If you could, you know, not be groggy, but just not have spoken, not have said a word. And somebody he was crossing a lawn very early, like at five in the morning, and someone happened to be out and said, "Oh, hey, Norman." He said, "Fuck you," and it was <laughs> and and he had to and he, he came back and apologized to the person later. He said, "Look, I didn't mean to be rude to you, but that was the only way to get you out of my system so that I could keep the keep the the still glass of water there because it's." It's not so much what you get in your dreams, but the, the clean slate that you wake up with, perhaps. 
I think it also may be worth noting, I don't know about you guys, but it, it also depends for me on what phase I'm in. If I'm trying to break down a story or understand a story, if I'm in the what if phase where I'm trying to understand what the structure is, I can only work for short periods of time and then I have to get up and shoot baskets or do something else. Whereas if I kind of, if I'm deeper into it and I understand the story and I'm doing the writing, I can, I can go for those sustained periods of time and kind of lose track of the time. Yeah. And if you're at the end, when all the biggest problems have been solved, and then you can do it at any time because you feel right. like you're you've forgotten. Then you're in the zone. all the yeah. torture and think I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! I can switch that. It makes it much better. And then you have to start another one. Remember what an idiot you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you know now just about the um, you know it, back in the green room we were having a very spirited discussion just about getting things made, and I'm just wondering uh, from each of your different points of view, you know, what is, how do you see uh, the present state of things? Is it, you know, uh, we were, there were optimists and pessimists, and I just, I wondered if we could just talk about story. What, what do we feel we ask ourselves of story, and what are the audiences asking of story, and are they the same thing? I'm not sure as a writer, I mean, you know, it, it's, sure. a, it's a valid question uh, to ask what does the audience want, but I'm not sure it's such a good question when you're figuring out what you want to write. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you have to trust that if it's something that really, that if you love movies and, and you feel like, oh my God, the only way I'm going to get to see this movie is if I write it, that's a good reason to write a movie. I mean, n not that it's not legitimate when you, when you go into to story meetings or to pitch meetings, you have to help them to see what the marketing campaign is going to be and, and you, you, know, you, right. you put on that hat. But I think if, you, you know, if we're trying to decide um, <clears throat> what do I want to write about, uh, you know, it's got to be, wow, that would be a cool movie and, and you hope that somebody else feels the same way. Right. Yeah, I, I confessed earlier to being stupidly optimistic in general across the board in life. But uh, every single movie I've made except uh, Pocahontas um, was, on the face of it, unmakeable. Every one was, there's no way somebody's going to make this. So I tend not to believe. The one thing I think about is castability. You know, if, if, because I, I have a certain degree of confidence that I can craft a character well, and if it fits into, you know, a casting category mm. that um, someone will want to get behind. And if, if it's not, you know, if you don't look at it and say, well, this is going to cost $85 million to make, and it's, you know, you obviously stay within the budgetary parameters that make it make sense. But but that's as far as I go in thinking about the market. Um, and it, you know, may come back to bite me in the ass really soon. But so far, it's been, a, it's worked. Yeah, I have to confess of not having an original answer here. I'll, I'll confess to being the pessimist in the green room. Um, but having said that, I try to forget all Trends, uh, things that are going on. I, I don't. I'm not interested really at all. I, I used to go to a lot more movies than I do now for mostly practical reasons. But I try to think of none of that. I try to do the best story I possibly can and let the chips fall where they may. I know that sounds really banal, but that's just the truth of it. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm sort of. Um, I think if I had been in the green room, I would have fallen into the optimist camp. I mean, there are <laughs> there are reasons that I despair, but just on, on a kind of um, business level. As somebody who made his living for a number of years off the fat of the Hollywood studio conglomerate development machineries, um, you know, those days aren't quite so fat. And in some ways, thank goodness, because they were about people developing movies that they had no intention of making um, just to please us. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so, so uh, you know, more accurately, I felt when I was beginning my writing work or beginning to actually being able to make a living off of my writing work, that this was sort of what the studio thought of as a movie. This was what really passionately interested me. And then there was this, you know, in that Venn diagram way, there was that little sweet spot, and I thought I could live in it forever. Um, so what it enabled me to do for a long time was write films that deeply engaged me that also studios thought they would want to, if not pay to make, at least pay to see what the script would look like. Uh, 
And of course, like anybody living in a gilded era, you know, never think of yourself as living in a gilded era, and you never see the sort of abyss that the next step will take you down <laughs> to. But I will say that in all that time, I only wrote one screenplay that I would not have wanted to go see if it were a movie, um, the Michael Jackson screenplay. But more about that perhaps <laughs> some other time. Um, <laughs> Master of suspense, Howard. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Wait, where's the optimist, Howard? Yeah. I don't here, know. <laughs> here's, here's the optimism there. Take us into an abyss. Um, <laughs> since the kind of um, collapse of, of the overlap in that little diagram where here's what studios think of as a motion picture and I'm over there, um, I've been able to write things that are more deeply engaging and and far more frequently get made, actually, mm. um, because they don't require the grandiose machineries of a studio. They don't require uh, people who don't like movies to say this is a movie. All they require really is one actor who you can write interestingly enough to seduce into wanting to play a part and a low enough budget so that that actor's salary can be paid for out of the budget. And if you can do that, you can make a movie. And I don't think that equation changes whether you're talking about big screens, little mm -hmm. screens, cell phone size screens, whether things are being distributed in celluloid cans or through pipes or through satellites. I genuinely think if you can write a story that deeply captivates a good actor and that if you can do it on a budget level that supports that actor's salary, you can make movie after movie after movie. Uh, another, oh, I sure, want to address that point in a different way, which is that sometimes, you know, I guess if you're lucky enough, you get typecast as a writer, where the marketplace decides who you are as a writer, um, you know, which can present a different kind of problem. After after Chocolat came out, I just kept getting, my agent kept sending me these books that were all about, you know, a little village in need of, a, <laughs> a, 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 you know, a radiant affirmation of the human spirit, you know, and it's like, you know, that's great, but I did it already. Yeah. And, and one of the things I did, you know, and sometimes I would take those assignments, um, because we all need to eat, but one of the things I did was to sit down and write a, 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 a script on spec, which I think is a really healthy thing to do, even when you don't have to. Um, you know, which was a, a nasty little, uh, uh, sort of darkly comic thriller, which is something that no one would ever hire me to write. Um, you know, just wrote it on my own, and now it looks like I'm getting it set up. I've got a director, and I wrote it knowing that it could be made for a budget. It could be made for six or eight million dollars, and I'm now getting it set up in England. We've got a director. We're, we're finding the money. Oh, um, terrific. You know, uh, so I took that chance because um, I knew that the marketplace would never pay for me to write that script, and I wanted to do something that was really different. Yeah. Well, these are such wonderful answers. I shouldn't complain about my own question, but I realized that I had the, something about the way I framed it made it sound more like I was being market oriented, which you know that was certain, certain, uh, certainly under our conversation before. But there was a certain area where we were touching on what really inspires us. You know, like uh, you were talking about opera, James and, and Susanna. You were talking about how audiences really do come still to the theater to be inspired. You know, I mean, it, it, whether they're being inspired by junk or not, they, they actually, the, the whole aspect of the old cinema ideal of getting into the big tent so you can share a collective emotion, you know, that that's still an interesting and inspiring phenomenon. I wonder, let, to steer the same question another way, what is it that inspires you most to make movies that's outside yourself? Are there examples of the kinds of movies you love to want to see more of that you would love to create that have influenced you from the works of the masters? <laughs> well, I, you know, the, the example that I just gave, it was because I said, yeah. gee, I'd love to do like a Coen Brothers film, and no one ever is going to hire me to do that, because I love these films that are violent, but they're also funny, mm -hmm. and I just, you know, so let's see if I can do that. Yeah. You know? I I'm, am a huge <coughs> fan of Sidney Pollack, and if I can live in the zone that he spent the bulk of his career in, I would be really, really happy. I agree with that. Um, I guess I'm a little um, artier, fartier. Um, I, I, I was always a huge, this is really pretentious actually, um, I was a huge fan as a kid going to these revival houses and we, I would see the strangest double features. You know, it would be like, A Gear of the Wrath of God and Bringing Up Baby, you know. It was like, you know, whatever they could get prints to. So my taste wound up being all over the map. But um, I became somewhere around the age of 22, 23, really obsessed with, like, uh, early Fellini movies, like Evie Teloni, Knights of Kiberia, La Strada. 
and nobody makes those ever now. So uh, the last movie I did was literally an attempt to rip that off completely. And I, of course, you know, he's uh, This is gone. Two Lovers, you're speaking. Yeah, Two Lovers. I, I was literally stole tons and stu stuff from early Fellini. It's not to say I think it's as good, don't worry. I think I thought it was as good as Fellini. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the, the mood of it, you know, the kind of um, uh, empathy for the characters, the kind of uh, uh, openness to the filmmaking. Uh, uh, f I, I just, yeah, I have a contrarian bone in me, and so, yes, I'm very moved. I'm, I'm a total cinema nerd, really, in, in, at heart, so I'm always trying to make the films, like, we on the night, which you mentioned, that that was my attempt to do like a movie that you might have found by accident that was made in like 1972 or something. Like a very, s I know it takes place in the late 80s, but it was uh, my attempt to make a very 70s style movie. Right, like the so Anderson tapes. Or yeah, something. well, I was yeah. more like I was thinking more Sydney like. Lumet, um, okay. yeah. Well, L L I was thinking more like if you if you merged Friedkin, Lumet, and Coppola, you know, and you had them, you got in a room and they all like got together and made a movie or something. And I, I so I I'm very much ripping them. The you know, ripping off what it is that I love, and I, I definitely steal from from hopefully from the best. Um, <clears throat> I think um, the movies that made me want to make movies, uh, f for the most part, uh, were what are now referred to as '70s movies. But I just think of them as movies, um, which were uh, <laughs> which were things that that sort of um, flirted with genre, but always did something else with it. I think about um, Night Moves, written by Alan Sharp, which is a movie I go back to again and again. Um, I think of Alzana's Raid, which actually is a western that he also wrote. Uh, I certainly think of, you know, um, the conversation and things like that. I mean, ev you know, when I work with students today, you know, um, they think that cinema began in 1975, you know, and I work so hard to convince them that it really began in 74. Uh. <laughs> conversation and Night Moves and, and Godfather too. Um, one, I, but what I really want to do is, um, I want to learn to write much more simply. When I see a movie like The Searchers, I think, boy, I wish I could write that, not just that sparely, but that economically and have mm. so much great effect with seemingly so little work and have enough trust in the image and the characters not to have, to have them sort of do too much. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do now. Um, Speaking of Artie Farty, I, you know, one of my favorite quotes was uh, something that Jean-Luc Godard once said, which was, as soon as we can make movies, we can no longer make movies like the ones that made us want to make them. And I used to think that was like the saddest sentence in the world. And maybe it's because I'm old or, or maybe it's because I, I, there's something in me that now finds that a, a really hopeful and optimistic sentiment as well, that the movies we make aren't just the movies that made us want to make them, but might do something else a little different, mm. and that's kind of kind of lovely. Uh, you know, you mentioned something interesting I, I, to me because I just recently have been going through like a John Ford thing, yeah. where I, I, my wife bought me this box set called Ford at uh, Ford at Fox. Oh, I've God, that's an amazing set. Amazing, yeah. and I'm like watching all these movies, and they're kind of like narratively perfect, and you want to. Kill yourself because they're so, and 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 it's amazing because like you know a shot of Walter Pigeon and you're weeping and you don't even understand why. Right. You're like what's going on here? But the the interesting thing that I I think about is which is uh, unreproducible, is um, the fact that f I don't know the Searchers must have been John Ford's. I don't know. You might know this 40th movie. Uh, like I think it was closer to his 90th, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, but like when he had made si Silence, I'm not counting those. But the sound yeah. film, how many? I don't, God knows how many. Probably up around 40 or I so. I mean, how yeah. he made Drums Along the Mohawk, uh, uh, Young Mr. Lincoln, and Grapes of Wrath, I think, in the same year. Yeah, uh, yeah and Stagecoach. Uh, and the Stagecoach? And Stagecoach. Right. Okay. Yeah, you forgot so Stagecoach. So we yeah. understand what we're talking about yeah, here. Yeah. There was an amazing ability to develop the craft, and most of yeah. art is craft. Yeah. So... I find myself struggling with the fact that I'm not doing it enough, that there is this, again, this bogus idea that, like, your first movie is the sign that you're a genius. But really, even if you look at Hitchcock, I mean, I know that people think, talk about uh, 39 Steps, Youngness, and all that 30 stuff, but for me, it is prime, the, the 50s stuff, Rear Window, Vertigo, yes. and then in, through Psycho, that's... 
he had been making pictures for a very long time by that point. And then he hits his stride. And he hit his stride, and he had been able to... I mean, you ever see the first three movies by Kubrick? They're not very good. So you're really talking about the fact that the person had to develop the craft. I don't know why that's funny. Uh, <laughs> but but the, the, he had to develop his craft. And I, I worry that we're not able to do that, you know, in a way that the studio filmmakers could, which is why they were such goddamn good storytellers. Well, a good example you touched on with John Ford. Okay, he not only did he do drums along the Mohawk, Young Mr. Lincoln, Grapes, of Wrath and Stagecoach in one here. He also did Tobacco Road, which is one of his worst movies. Right. Now, it's an interesting failure because it's it's basically like uh, Little Abner. You know, I mean, it's hillbillies. It's like Grapes of Wrath, the farce. Right. You know, and you got he just uh, talking in this hillbilly dialect. That's which so one did he make Mars. first? Huh? Which I, one did he make first? I believe he made Grapes of Wrath first, and then it's too bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I believe, but but then he went. He turned around, and then he made They Were Expendable. So, which is like actually one of the the best of his whole career. So. It's sort of like he coughed up a hairball and then could sing sing opera again, you know. Well, that's that's the experience you get now if you work in television, though. You know, that's that's I did three years on a series, and the the ability to look at something and say, "Well, oh, that didn't work. Let's not do that again. Let's do something else," and just keep churning them. It, the problem is in TV is that you you feel like you're building uh, one specific set of muscles very well and then a bunch of others atrophy but uh, but you do get that I mean TV is a great place for that and there are TV shows that don't hit their stride until the second or third year because exactly. there's all that this it's this laboratory for refining the characters but what what James said is you know it's one of my worst nightmares and I think you articulated it you know scary well which is you look at the careers of the people you really adore and admire as writers. You look at, I don't know, Samson Rafelson, who's a writer I particularly like, or you look at Suso Keki D'Amico, who wrote, I believe, 103 or 104 movies, and she's still alive, and she's still writing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, after a while, you get to find your voice. Well, what if you only write three, four, five, seven films? What if your career ends before you actually even know what your voice is? Yeah. And that haunts my waking and sleeping moments all the time. And I live in fear of it, and I think I'm going to die before I've even really written that thing that's me. And I don't know what to do about that fear. Um, sorry, I guess that's the pessimist. You keep side. writing. <laughs> that's the optimist again. It's so full of optimism. You're pawning yourself off as an optimist. <laughs> the Trojan horse m method of peth pessimism. Good, good little uh, pitch for a Suso Jake and Amico. I like that. It's good. Yeah, and then there's uh, Tonino Guerra, who's like the, the great Italian screenwriter. I mean, it, the thing is, it's, and I, I guess there's a, an interesting point that you spoke to, Howard, before about the, the sort of development hell or development Hades in which many scripts were were developed and never produced. And I think that part of the energy of screenwriting comes from seeing your work performed. I think it's a, it's a form of doom if you are in that development track and you are making a living, but you're not actually having actors play your stuff. Because, and I guess the, the question I'd like to pose to all of you is like, what what have you learned from actors performing your stuff? What is the how do, how have you dealt with what Howard was talking about about becoming spare? Could you each speak to a little bit of that? I was issue? just going to say you you learn very quickly to write less. Um, you learn you know after you've had a few movies produced, you start to write a scene or you look at a scene that you've written. You say that's going to end up on the cutting room floor. Let's cut it now and save time. And you see what actors can do, what good actors can do, um, sometimes without dialogue at all. And you and you know that sometimes the best scenes you've written don't e <coughs> excuse me don't even contain dialogue. Yeah, but you do, I, I don't know about you all, but if, if you're, sometimes you have to kind of leave that in to get it, to get it through you leave it in the, for the studio, studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and then yeah. it comes out studio proof it <laughs> yeah you know the some the thing that you know you'll read the sort of explicit the, statement of in theme. an actor's uh yeah exactly yeah. the the statement of what i want and and what the movie is about and and you'll drop it uh That's but it's true. not just it's not just the actors this is the actors but it's it's the act of getting it you know the the blueprint that is a uh, script into the structure that is a uh, movie i mean it can be it can be an actor it can be you know a production reality it can be a, a read through it can be a at any stage there's a point where you are thinking uh, well maybe i don't need that <laughs> you know more that's more often what what you think or uh, um it just it needs to shift a bit this way. Really, the blueprint is the best analogy I can I can mm -hmm. think of. Um. Well, I guess what uh, I learned having made the films from the scripts is the b brutal 
an unforgiving nature of narrative where it's all about sequential linkage and you can write a scene and even direct the scene, dare I say it, and the acting can be wonderful. I, I, I will tell a very brief, I promise, story where my confidence as a creative person has never recovered from March 4th, 1994. I remember it incredibly <laughs> clearly. I was in film school. I thought I was the greatest director in the history of the world. And then I was making my first film and I was very, very fortunate. And I had an amazing cast and I would be working in the scene. I was 23 years old and Vanessa Redgrave was playing in the scene with Tim Roth. And I thought, well, I'm just, I'm the man. And I would, I would watch dailies. Back then they screened dailies on film. And I would watch the dailies and I would sit there and go, well, you know what? Guess what? Mastery. Mastery. <laughs> and March, I remember this, that day I went to see the assembly. And I remember going in thinking I was going to see Umberto D. And what I saw was completely worthless. And I realized that all of the writing and, and attempted directing of actors that I had done, I had made so many mistakes because it's all about how scene A connects to scene B, connects to scene C. And so it, things, context meant everything. And my major mistake was not uh, um, adjusting performance with actors reading my dialogue to account for this concept. And I had been living in my bubble with my little computer, at the time I was a typewriter, and I thought, oh, I'm the greatest. And I was so wrong in every way. So what was helpful to me, I think, in seeing the work performed, finally, was understanding um, not only, of course, that silence mattered a great deal. I mean, if you look at Robert De Niro in close-up, it's enough that he says nothing. And I know this because I saw him on stage do a thing called Cubanus Teddy Bear 20 years ago, and I was watching it thinking, he's not that good, what's the problem? And then you look at a movie he's in and that the relationship is so intimate with the camera. But I, and I, I didn't know any of this, and it all needed to be seeing it performed by actors. All of it. Yeah, that narrative... Uh demand is so compelling when you finally get the movie together. I, I had a scene in Catch and Release, which was probably the best written scene, possibly the best acted scene, and from the beginning I kept trying to protect it. You know, how can I put something essential in this scene? And of course it's not in the movie. I should have known it, you know, well before, save myself half a day. You know, it was, it, it is, it's merciless. If you can take it out, do it now. Or it's like that funny line that you love and you keep trying to use that funny line. <laughs> if Next it doesn't movie. serve the story, it's got to go. Uh, you know, uh, what, James, what you were saying about context, I remember hearing Robert Town talk about, someone asked him what's good dialogue, like how do you write a good line? He said it, it all depends, uh, the most mundane line in the correct context, and he used the example of Godfather Part Two, where you see De Niro go through that whole Feast of San Gennaro sequence, where he assassinates the guy and he picks up the baby and he says, Michael, your father loves you very much, which is a line that could appear on any soap opera, it's a completely mundane line. In that context, it is a chillingly good line. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes, it's the same thing as everybody else. The first time I wrote something that was filmed with real actors, not like actors who were my roommates and stuff. Um, the two actors were English actors of, of the English school, um, Ian Holm and Jeremy Irons. And each of them was a little bit sort of, you know, I can do less in this scene than you can, dear boy. <laughs> And fortunately, we had a rehearsal period, and I'd written this scene that was three pages, and when they, you know, re literally from the moment they started saying the lines, it became clear that it was sort of like the drum was going thump, 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 and the bass was going dun, 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 the guitar was going jin, 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 and I was asking them to go ee, 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 ee. <laughs> you know, um, it, it was already there in their faces. So we cut about half the scene, and then we ran it again, and we cut it again. And it was the, you know, I learned more in that one day than I'd learned in all of the meetings leading up to that. And I also learned, I think, another valuable lesson from actors, um, which is when I'm like looking for a word and can't find the right word, it just isn't dropping down in my head, so I use this other word, it's always cruddier. But when I have a line reading in my head of how a scene should be played and an actor comes along and, and does it in a completely different way, it's almost always more interesting and there's more layers there than I had thought. So, you know, we write for actors uh, and, and if that makes us, you know, if that's a debased medium, I know, you know, in Shakespeare's time the epic poem was the medium and 
playwrights, you know, they wrote for actors. But I think we do, and I think that's the best thing about what we do. The most I've ever learned really comes from watching first rough assemblage, next rough cut, rougher cut, finer cut, finer cut. I don't think there's any better way to learn about writing and narrative than by seeing from the first dismal rough assemblage to something approaching a film you can watch how those narrative links, um, a friend of mine who's a cinematographer calls them the from twos, how those from twos work. And I think, I think James, that's sort of what you were talking about too. Just the way in which, how one scene gets to another or how one scene doesn't get to another right. really, really is kind of really all we do. Structure. I would like to open it up to the floor. I have a technical question. Do we have a microphone that will go about? Okay, great. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, given uh, the constraints of screenwriting and the collaborative nature of once your screenplay is in the hands of other people, do any of you write uh, for yourselves in any other uh, medium? Yes. Uh, I also write um, fiction, which is sort of writing for myself in another medium, you know, where I'm not dependent on... Uh, acting or even to, to some extent financing. Um, you know, uh, I would love to write plays, but I can't figure out how to get people on and off stage. It's always buffaloed <laughs> me, so I don't. Um, and I've um, directed things I haven't written, and I've written things I haven't directed, but I haven't done both at the same time. Well, I started out writing short fiction. I mean, that, that's, you know, I went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, and I was writing short stories and getting them published in these nice little magazines where they pay you, literary magazines that pay you with extra copies of the magazine <laughs> so that you can show them to your parents and say, see, I, you know, um, you know, and I have this feeling that, uh, that when I get to the point where no one will hire me to write movies anymore, I'll start writing stories again. I write letters, actually. No, but I do. That's actually, writing letters is sort of I've, how I sort of found uh, a little bit of my voice. I think it's very hard to find uh, a voice in the screenplay format. I think there's so much about it that's technical that um, it wasn't until I'd been writing letters for a long time to people that I thought, oh, that that sounds like that sounds like me and 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 things that I care about. And I wonder what other form that could take. But I still write a lot of letters. It's a lost art, letter writing. It is. Uh, I, I don't do any other writing, never have. I uh, don't like it very much. I think the process is really tor torturous and tortuous. Uh, I only started writing because, I mean, I'd wanted to put on the beret and the jodhpurs, jodhpurs, I don't know how you pronounce it, and, you know, and talk into a brown bullhorn. I thought that was directing, you know, and that was what made films. And then I realized the screenplay was more important, so I'd better learn how to do that. I've never done any other writing. I probably should, but I don't. It's, it's called laziness. <laughs> I, I wanted to speak to these you brought in critics. I, I, I don't know about you know the, the demographics. They, there are more and more variety among critics, but the Irish writer Frank O'Connor said something really beautiful about writing. Uh, he was speaking about short stories in particular. And short stories have their application to movies because he said novels will x-ray a society, but he said the short story is the great medium for calling forth the submerged population, to giving voice to a submerged population. And I think that the best movies do that. Somehow, that that what what you asked, what a minority could contribute. I think many writers, whatever their gender, whatever their ethnicity, are odd enough, became writers out of an oddness and out of being a minority in their own head. That they, that it is a minority voice and a submerged population. I think of, you know, a little village or Erin Brockovich and what her her blue collar roots or the or you know any of the characters in all your films. You're dealing with a submerged population. I mean, Savage Grace. It's a mother and son who are a submerged population, and they're a lethal world under themselves. Or the or the, We Own the Night and Two Lovers. What those two very different Different films have in common is the the submerged level at which the characters are living. You know, they're out of the sight of of the public view, but the movie makes them public to us. And and so I think that when when we speak of you know what movies must avail themselves of, you know, we need more variety of people because that will bring that voice up. But every writer has to find that that unvoiced population in their own head. That's the that's the universality of the problem. I think. Because we're not in a Senate hearing room, I'm going to make a remark that I'm not going to have to walk back, which is that a wise Latina can contribute more to the cinema <laughs> than, um, 
<laughs> most of the folks who now make cinema. That's it's great. simply true. Do um, do you guys write with anybody? Do you, is it helpful to write with actors in mind? Does that help you clarify the character if you're responsive to a particular star? Not thinking of the marketing, but just who you like, and do you do you try different people out in the roles when you're writing it? It depends on the on the project. I mean, the, the project that I was describing earlier, Crowley, which just wrapped a few weeks ago, we knew that Harrison Ford was going to play the, the doctor, the difficult doctor from the start, and I had a lot of meetings with him, and he was somewhat difficult in the meetings, uh, which were which were ultimately really productive, and I, and I love the guy, but it was really great that I got to mix it up with him a little bit so that I could hear his voice when I was writing it. I mean, there are other times where I intentionally will not, uh, you know, a movie has not, there is no casting, and I intentionally will, will not try to think of an actor because I won't want to limit myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, another example, the, the first movie that I ever had produced was uh, the, uh, the Jack Lemmon, Walter Matho comedy, Out to Sea. And I knew there was no way that movie was going to get made unless they got those two particular actors. So it was very much just kind of channeling them when I wrote it. So it really depends on what, what the movie is. James? Uh, the answer for me is never. It's, I find it unbelievably dangerous because of... I don't get the actor I've imagined. I, I, I mean, what does that mean? Right. I mean, I, so I always try to imagine, a really, I, I, frankly, usually basing it on a, on a real person that I know or part partly me, partly somebody else. You know, I'm always trying to right. base it on something and never some famous dude or woman who's going to, you know, not do the movie and then I cry. You know, that's <laughs> right. dangerous, dangerous territory. Um. Everything I write, I imagine Terrence Stamp playing the role. <laughs> <laughs> I have a corollary. I always try to write a part for Judy Dench. <laughs> I never do, but uh, I think it's just because it's the only time when it's mine. Yeah. It's that first, that your writing period is the only time when it's all yours. And I don't want some stinking star in my face then. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, it's mine. Your question. Thanks. Um, I was just curious when you talk about sort of finding your way in the dark and tunneling down the wrong path to try to find a story. Um, obviously when you talk to a studio about a project, whether it's a book or a real life story, you have to kind of have a certain amount of clear to, um, to get the job, to get the gig. So I was curious how far do you go down the line of figuring it out before you have that meeting with the with the studio? Well, I'm wrestling with that right now, actually, uh, uh, wondering how much how much I know about it and how much I can pretend I know. And and some of it is when you're trying to get the job, uh, you you always at least for me, I'm always acting more confident than I really am because I don't know where it's going to go or how how it's going to work. And so you say, here's what I figured out. Here's how it's going to be. It's this is going to work great. And then if you get the job, you f I panic. You know, I go back to my room and say, now how am I actually going to do it? And about halfway through, you call him up and say, you know, a couple things we're going in a slightly different direction with. And, uh, you know, this is going to be a little different. And uh, But you, that's a, I feel like that's a whole um, skill that almost has nothing to do with writing. That's about getting a job. It's a useful uh, skill. It's useful. Have. You know, yeah. Uh, but, but, I mean, what you think the movie is four weeks in, for me, is rarely... Uh, really what the movie is, you know? I mean, it, it resembles it. I mean, it's, if it's a book adaptation, it's different, but pitching an original is, is very tricky that way, I found. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really, really bad at what you're talking about, and it drives me nuts because I always, and I always talk to people and say, well, I don't understand the point of that because then if I'm telling them everything I've done, I've done all the work already and they should, have, they should pay me the second I walk into the room. Mm -hmm. I go, I'm here, for, hey, I'm here for the pitch, pay me the money. You know, like that's what I feel like it should be because then I've done all the work. So I'm really bad at pitching and uh, I've just been very lucky or there's been an actor attached already that they really want to work with so it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing because usually I'm like, guys, I think the picture's about this. Uh, I want to try and do that and then they'll inevitably call up, you know, my agent or something and go, yeah, he really was not good in the room. I don't really know. <laughs> and then Somehow I managed to get the job anyway, you know, that, that kind of thing. I'm, it's a great question. I'm very bad at it. Um, I, I knock my head against this wall all the time because 
it used to be that, for instance, if I wanted to adapt a book, I could go into a producer or a studio and say, here's this wonderful book, here's why it would make a fantastic movie, here are five problems with adapting it, things that need to be solved. I would solve this one this way, this one this way, I would change that character, combine these two, and these two, I don't know how I'm going to do, but I know I'm going to find a way to do them. And that would often be enough to get me the job. These days, in order to get the job, I almost have to have made the movie, transcribed it, and then made a beat sheet from the transcription in order to get the job of writing the movie that I want to, want to write. Mm. The amount of specificity and detail that is required to get a job these days, at least on the levels that, that I work on, is frightening and astonishing and daunting and I think really, really bad. Because um, when you're doing those things for a beat sheet, you're not really writing. Your characters are not leading you anywhere. You're just kind of trying to figure out this thing that will get you a job that will, from a distance of five feet, look like a movie. But I know it's not really a movie. And I think where I've been fortunate is I've worked with producers who, when the first draft comes in and it doesn't adhere to those beats but goes in a way that its own internal life demands that it go, don't kill me in my sleep. <laughs> um, but, but it's hard, and I don't know any way around it. I also feel like that conversation isn't really what it's about. It's them saying, okay, we're going to be paying you money for which we are accountable. Is it going to be a mistake? And you're going to tell them something with confidence that says it will not be a mistake. And and so you proceed. I, I, I think it's I think that dialogue is as much about um, making them comfortable with giving you the job. And it, it may in fact be what the movie is or it may not be what the movie is. But you're saying to them, I'm a professional, I do my job well, and when I give you it, you won't be unhappy. And, uh, you know, that's really what, what the conversation is. And sometimes, I mean, of course, the more you actually love the thing that you're talking about, the more they will they will pick up on that. I mean, you, you know, as Susanna says, I mean, you're walking into a room where people are operating from anxiety. Um, and if they can tell that you love it, even if you don't know exactly how to do it yet, um, that'll help. Lady in blue here. And then gentleman there in gray. Um, so one thing that's death to a screenplay is if all the characters talk the same. So I was wondering if you could talk about your approach to dialogue and juggling, making it sound natural, but being wittier and more entertaining than, you know, normal speech. <laughs> it's hard. It's sort of the most instinctive part of the process. I mean, there, you know, there's the, the construction of the screenplay and then, the, and then the, the construction of the scenes. And then when you're actually writing the dialogue, that's probably the most instinctive part of the process where you're just kind of, if you've thought enough about the characters and, and have some understanding of them, then you trust that words will come out. I, I'm not sure that there's a, a method to that so much. I would actually almost say unlearnable. I mean, I think it's either you, something you do or, or, or I don't know that you can learn that, honestly, to, to, I mean, I have always, since well before I wrote, heard and spoken and, you know, it was like the annoying kid who starts speaking British to the person who's British talking to her, you know, it just, it's fun. It's, I have great joy in how people articulate themselves. It's just very interesting to me. So I don't know that you can learn it. Could you think? Does anyone think you can learn that? Well, I, James said something that, 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 that struck me as a possibility. It's a, it, pointing out to thinking of people you know. For example, I mean, I was once trying to do something where I had a cartoonish character who was, it was a movie producer, as it happens. He was jumping around like a Tasmanian devil, and I was going, okay, I've seen that, and I, you know, in movies. But, <laughs> but in life, okay, what, I, and I've met, I've met enough people, and I thought, well, wait a second. And I thought of one person in particular who would be, and throw a tantrum by being icy cold. And like keeping his voice down and saying, instead of you're fired, I thought you worked for me. And, I th <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, now I'm writing that down. And sudden, suddenly it was like, and it's not something that real person ever said, but it was in their tone. And I, I guess if there's a method, it has to do with your observation, perhaps, and being able to, to sort of stir the pot and call for the, you know, the right the right character to throw in to try and authenticate what you're going for is that well i yeah i was going to say what what uh, i've always viewed it as is almost like you know the way they 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 call a method acting you know and i i always 
sort of try to think of screenwriting as a method exercise in a way where I try to use, e if I have trouble writing a certain character's dialogue, I often try to think of it almost in uh, substitution, you know, like if uh, if somebody is having, if somebody, uh, if there's a scene between two people, one person's trying to explain something, the other person can't understand it all, I, I try to think, okay, this is a conversation I'm having with my agent who's talking to me about some, you know, minute detail that I can't fathom, and I try to, you know what I'm saying, I try to put myself into it in a way uh, where, or, or based it on other people that I know, where they have a certain voice, it's a, it's almost like I have to believe it, and then hopefully that shows. If I believe each character, and also empathize with each character, even if the character is a villain, if I understand the character's position in the scene, that hopefully a, a truth will come forward. I, I know this sounds like an abstraction, but it's the process for me, so I've been totally unhelpful. Thank you. <laughs> um. I'm oh. not entirely convinced that in a good screenplay everybody has to talk, speak differently. I mean, I, I look at Juno, where, where everyone in that movie, including the guy behind the counter in the drugstore, s talks the same way. David Mamet sometimes. And, and I think that really works. You know, um, in terms of my own stuff. Um, it is instinctive. You sort of know the characters in your head so that when they start speaking through you, they are speaking through you and they have their own cadence and rhythm and vocabulary. And on a good day, you could probably take uh, a fat marker and take the names off of the thing and know who was speaking just by how they were speaking. Um, that doesn't always happen. On bad days when that isn't happening, uh, by instinct, I do it mechanically. Um, which is to say, think of all the things you can tell about someone by how they speak. Um, you know, upper class, lower class, from the Midwest, from the South. Um, you know, male, female, born in the 1930s, born in the 1980s. You have so many sliders on your control panel that it really isn't that difficult by just moving enough of them to have somebody speak distinctively for who they are. And then I think then you have to go back and just make it work because that's all too mechanical and crafty. Another thing about dialogue um, is that if you're if you're well into a script and you feel like you do understand the characters and kind of have their voices, but you're writing a scene and the dialogue is not working well, a lot of times you have to look at how that scene is structured. Is the scene starting at the right place? Should it be started later? Are the characters doing the right things? You know, do you have them uh, sitting across a desk from each other? Would it be better if one of them were uh, picking weeds from the garden and the other one were shooting pheasant out of the sky? Whatever it is, I mean, you know, uh, there are a lot of choices that you can make about the scene that will, uh, it, there are actions that you can give them sometimes which will allow you to use less dialogue and make that dialogue better. Your question, sir. Hi, my question is for James. Uh, a couple years ago when you were doing the circuit for We on the Night, you said something that really stuck with me. It was the story about how you got Ed Koch to get into your movie. Uh -huh. And about that, how you basically staked out the restaurant in New York and how you met him and what he said to you. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. And I think with that tenacity and you doing it, how can we apply that to the current work environment where people are telling us that dramas and true stories don't work anymore? If that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. A okay. great uh, question. You may want to tell the story first. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> the story you're talking about, Ed Koch plays the mayor of New York in 1988. Well, that's not really a stretch. <laughs> although we, although I will tell you now, I'm gonna, the cat's out of the bag. I had to do a little CG work to make him look uh, the right age, because you know, he's not, and he was very cantankerous when he showed up. Yeah, he was like, I don't remember how, wh how much of this I told you guys, but where, where was this? What the hell was I saying? Jeez, that's terrible. Pardon me? The arc light. Arc light. Well, I, I, I remember I, he had to, he had like two lines in the whole film and, you know, we had to, it was like, I had to like reschedule the whole film like six times to get him from this, <laughs> this one day where he would hopefully come and he showed up and he's like, I have only 42 minutes because my talk show is on. And he's like, and, and he like showed up in like two minutes after he got there, literally two minutes, he's coming, Mr. Director, he called me, Mr. Director, can we please go? I'm like, no, you're not in makeup or, or wardrobe. Like, what do you mean? It's like, he had no understanding of the machinery. <laughs> well, I wanted him to be in the movie and and we called his people and they said no and you know Ed remember the mayor does not his honor does not do that he's a very busy guy blah 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 and I found out this is what you're talking about I found out that he had a table at a restaurant in New York 
Trattoria del Arte on 57th Street, uh, and I found out that this is where he went, and he had a specific table, and I knew it was great. I had like a spy, a waiter who worked <laughs> at the restaurant, and I kept going there, and of course, the guy went there like every Tuesday at like 8, he had his table, and I kept going every Tuesday at 8, and he was never there, and I was like, well, I don't say, you told me he comes here every time, that's obviously a lie, and then, and finally I found out he was like on some trip to like the Ukraine, to like, you know, some business trip. Finally Finally, I found I saw him come in there, and I I had my script, and I got so incredibly nervous. And all I said was, "I need you to be in this movie, please." Here's the script, <laughs> and he said, "Who are you? What are you? What are you?" And I told him who I was, and he said, "Terrific! You made a pitch in one of my favorite movies of all time." I said I did, and I was really scared because people have told me that before, and then they they think I'm like Darren Aronofsky or something. <laughs> So I thought he was going to tell me something. But he said, Little Odessa, I love it. On my radio show, I talk about it all the time. I said, well, guess what? This is Little Odessa 2. So, <laughs> so I, think, I, think, I think you'd be top quality. And then I remember what he said was he said, yeah, I'll do your picture. I'll do that thing of yours. And then he was like unreachable and it was impossible. Well, how do you apply that? To you're, you're asking like the time. I mean, I must confess to you, I think things are... I'm, I'm the pessimist. Uh, by the way, you and your Mr. Optimism, you're like, I think things are bad every two seconds, you're saying. So I love you, <laughs> Howard, but you know. I think things are really tough right now to do a dramatic picture. They're just... And, and a, on a certain budget scale. I mean, let me qualify that. Right. And, and the reason I think that is a crisis is because you can do a six to eight million. I mean, I did this movie, Two Lovers. I had complete creative control and final cut and everything. And it was basically a little reward for me making them some money. So they said, here's $11 million and we won't bother you at all. And I made this picture and it was exactly what I wanted to make. But 29 days. And the truth of the matter is, if you want to do something terrific, a lot of the time, not that I would know, but it takes, it takes time. And what I used to love, I mean, Francois Truffaut once said, he said, great pictures, he thought, were part truth, part spectacle. So what you have seen in the business now is this kind of movement where you have 100, 200 million dollar movies, which are all spectacle and no truth, and then you've got the pictures that cost a million bucks, and Johnny uh, F uh, Fredericks, who directed the movie, is going to take the camera off the tripod, and he's going to do a digital, digital video, and it's kind of impenetrable and the craft is awful, but you're finding a kernel of truth in a performance, but it's pretty a pretty miserable experience, and, and you're unhappy. And what's missing is the beautiful middle, which United Artists, frankly, in the 70s used to occupy, where they had a picture of a certain budgets, a budget, which enabled you a kind of expressiveness, but at the same time, it was you know, Jake LaMotta beating up his brother. I mean, that's exactly the movie, right? That movie cost $17 million in 1980, which is $80 million today, $70 million today, black and white, and he's beating up his brother and his, his wife, and it's miserable and horrible, and it's great. So where do those movies go? They're gone. I think they might be gone forever. So I'm, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I'm the pessimist, but I think that that style of filmmaking is gone. So I think the thing to do is... Well, you know, there's several different strategies. Uh, Samuel Fuller once said, um, pardon my French, but if you want to make a movie, sometimes you just have to bullshit him. So he would basically lie and try and get the movie made that way. Uh, to me, I feel like what is important now is to try and figure out a way on a smaller scale to speak your truth and somehow imply a greater spectacle. I, I know this makes very little sense, but then the way to get that done, I think, is simply, uh, it is persistence. It is... Uh, the belief in your own material to the degree that it is so great it's going to change the world, which is why writers and directors are very damaged people, because they have such an inflated sense of self, I know, I certainly do, that when I'm doing something, it's so important, it has to be done. Do you know what I mean? So that and you said it before when you're pitching and the passion sort of, it sort of translates in a way that the Frady cats, they kind of like it when some person uh, presents him or herself as knowing what they're doing. And I clearly don't, but I like the idea that I do and I like to sell that idea. So, pardon me? Right. And I think that that is nine tenths of the law, really. I think it's a kind of passion that you have to bring to the process, that you think you know what you're doing and it's going to be so great and how stupid would they be not to give you the money to make that picture. So I will not lie to you. I think it's a huge battle ahead, but I think persistence does win. I really do. I, th I, I, I think, the, I mean, 
I, 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 everybody turns down everything I do 40 times. Then you have to keep going back. I mean, even actors. Mark Wahlberg did not want to do We on the Night, and he's probably sorry he did now. But no, Mark Wahlberg did not want to do the We on the Night. I, I, I called him every single day for nine months and <laughs> left a message. Uh, he'd be like, finally, he goes, Jim, I guess I got some free time. A couple months from now, Jim, I got some free time. And so we had six weeks of prep, and we got the whole movie together, and then he was in it, you know. <laughs> wow. Well, this has been a fantastic evening, you guys. I mean, this is just great. Uh, thank you so much.